right, how are you guys doing? You good? All right, awesome. So thank you all very much for joining us on this awesome hackathon. And I'm very, very honored to introduce to you our first and very interesting keynote speaker. And that is Max. Uh, Max, I would like to welcome you in States. Max is working for the UN. Give him a warm welcome. Here's Max. Okay. Um, yeah, so first of all, thank me for inviting to this um, really cool place. I already had some nice talks with them. So, um, um, But first of all, let me introduce myself a bit further. Um, I'm Max. I'm 20 years old. And I am the Dutch Youth Representative on Sustainable Development to the United Nations. Um, but before going into that a little bit deeper, I think it's maybe interesting to find out a little bit why I actually wanted to do this whole sustainable development thing and why it really interests me and also why I'm interested in things like this. So basically this actually started um, maybe some time ago. Like when I finished high school, um, everybody was expecting to just go to like right after high school to go to university or to the next college or anything. But I actually went first um, to do volunteer work in uh, abroad. So I started in Tanzania. And here I was a mathematics and physics teacher on a secondary school. And um, yeah, that was really interesting because being a teacher in Tanzania is not really uh, anything like being a teacher over here. And especially not when you're just starting and actually only finished high school and doing something like this. But it was really an, a really cool experience to engage with these young people and to, to work together with them. And I think the most interesting part was actually when we at once, by chance, had um, a debate day, which was organized by some other volunteers, but my uh, class also had to participate. And the debate was about climate change, about like um, what, is, what is the really important thing about climate change, what does it mean, and things like that. And I remember that from high school, I was always thinking like, yeah, climate change, it's yeah, something that is about rising sea levels of a few centimeters, the CO2 going up, but it was not really something that really, yeah, what I really felt or what I really saw happening around me. But then in this place, with these students who were like really young and um, climate change actually came really nearby because yeah. they weren't talking about like rising CO2 level, uh, sea levels or rising uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. They were talking about actually deforestation in their forests like nearby or they were talking about waste on the street. They were talking on things that actually affected them. They were talking about floods nearby. So I think that's the, the moment when I really realized, yeah, like actually these CO2 levels here might seem really abstract and like, yeah, far away. But on other sides, on other places that are way more vulnerable, they're actually really concrete. So after that sparked my interest, I uh, decided to go to uh, another place. I went to India to work for an NGO. Uh, and here I was actually working on an environmental education project. So I was like full time going from class to class, from school to school, from village to village, to talk with uh, local people about, yeah, environmental issues, about climate change, about uh, waste about all kinds of stuff. So it really ra it really ranged from going to these international schools with students from Dubai um, up to like sitting in a tent community with migrant workers on the ground under a mango tree on a mat and uh, giving education there. But the, the, the really interesting part was that also here those people were really concerned about these issues. Well, I was thinking like if you're a migrant worker living in a tent next to the highway, you might have other concerns. But actually, they were willing to, to listen and to, to, to cooperate and to build kitchen gardens nearby and to help with uh, beach cleanings and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was also a really interesting time and, and, and really a place where you could yeah, see that what we're doing here has effect on the people there. And also, yeah. So that, that was really also something that sparked my interest. And then to, to round it up, I also lived for a, a couple of more months in Nepal in a really small village um, where there actually were no roads, no house numbers, there was no internet. Uh, and I stayed there for two months, just living really locally, and uh, we ate the food that was just grown in, in the garden, and um, yeah, the life was real easy there, and that was really, maybe not really that much academically in, uh, a, a learnful process for me, but it was really like, more like the way of living. What does it mean to live sustainable, to eat local food, to, to do things like that? Um, and then afterwards, at some point, yeah, I had to go back to the Netherlands, you can stay uh, for always there. And when I got back, like in the beginning, it's really nice. You can have like, uh, I remember that when I got back, I made like every day a picture of my meal, sending it to my friends there, like saying, like uh, from, from Tanzania, like saying, yeah, I have, we have these really big meals and, and going by car, you can go everywhere. But then after, after some time, yeah, you feel like it doesn't quite fit or it doesn't seem like, yeah, maybe for, one, for, for a month it was nice, but then at some point you feel like this is not really the system you want to live in or something. Or like, and 
that really yeah, sparked the process of finding a way how can we live in this different system because we're not living here in a, in a Nepali village with, uh, with that kind of stuff. We, also have, we want to do really cool stuff, but how can we do that in a sustainable manner? Well, so um, then I started studying finally. With, uh, yeah, I had to study also for my parents and stuff. So um, I, st I started studying at uh, Leiden University College on a program called Global Challenges. So I was thinking like, yeah, now I've, I've seen some part of the world, but now I'm actually going to learn about it. Um, but already after, after a month or something, I was thinking, yeah, this is only, only learning stuff and I actually want to do things again. I want to, to go out and, and, and talk with people and, and initiate projects and stuff like that. So um, actually one of my uh, fellow classmates told me about this opportunity to become a youth representative on sustainable development. I was like, yeah, uh, let's give it a go. And after several rounds, um, yeah, I got, I got elected as new Dutch youth representative. Actually, everybody can, uh, can apply for it, so keep that in mind for September. Um, and as a youth representative, I basically you become the link between, on the one hand, young people, uh, basically in the Netherlands, and the policy makers up to the United Nations level. Well, and uh, we were also talking about connecting people and uh, making connections. And well, there is quite a challenge to connect like young people and their language to up to the United Nations level where everybody is, yeah, in a, it's like a whole different cosmos kind of thing. But that is what I do. So um, I go to the United Nations talking there about what we as young people think important. Actually, I just got back yesterday from, uh, from Bonn, the UNFCCC climate change conference, um, where we were talking about how can we do what we, what we achieved in Paris and this whole agreement and saying that we have to do things about climate change. How are we actually going to implement it? Because that's the whole next step. So, um, yeah, we've been talking about it with the U UN and also, um, yeah, kind of things, but it's a really slow process, so it's way more fun to be here with young people who actually do things. But anyway, so, th so that's one part of it. And the other part, I'm also really active in the Netherlands, going, I give a lot of guest lectures on schools, on, on primary schools, secondary universities, to talk about, yeah, what, what, how does this UN system work, but also about what do you think is important uh, regarding this whole climate change issue and what are, what are the messages I should bring to the UN. So well, that is basically a little bit what I do. And I think the, the key concept to, to get out of this is maybe um, yeah, what we're also doing here is this part of connection. Because uh, I remember last week I was sitting in a session at the UN and uh, one guy actually made the statement that he said, uh, connecting people is the same as uh, accelerating climate change. Because, and yeah, this was kind of a weird statement, why would connecting people be, uh, always be like accelerating climate change? But this is basically that idea of uh, climate justice. Like the fact, for example, that I went to Tanzania and I saw the people there and I knew what was happening on the ground, that they were suffering from, from droughts and floods and things like that. That makes me uh, have a critical thought on the, on the behavior I have, on the things I buy in the supermarket, on the things I do on daily life. So basically that connection, um, knowing what, your effect of your behavior is on other people, makes you do things differently. And I think also one of the, the key challenges of this hackathon will have quite a lot to do with this. Like how can you change behavior of people and how can you do that by connecting people? So even this is a subject that we are talking about in this local setting, but it's also something that the UN and on, on world scale level people are really talking about and trying to find ways how to do this. Um, well, I don't want to talk too long, so I think I'm gonna wrap it up because we have a really exciting uh, next speaker who is also uh, a break dancer, but I'm not sure if he's actually uh, gonna break dance right now, but, um, but anyway, <laughs> probably not. So I think the, the key message that we have to remember from this, fr from this talk is about the importance of connecting people in order to change behavior and in order to accelerate climate change. Well, I'm gonna wrap it up in here and then there's maybe some time for questions. I don't know, it depends also on what the rest of the program is. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna consult with the Okay, then hereby I would like to wrap up my thing and maybe open the floor some some questions if you have any. Could be about anything. Uh, what current project are you working on with the UN? Okay, so what project am I working on with the UN? Well, uh, my main topic of focus is um, 
It's called ACE, Action for Climate Empowerment. And it's basically about how can we uh, do by means of uh, education, public awareness, public participation, uh, training and things like that, how can we use those factors to accelerate climate change? So I'm involved in, yeah, this, there was lately in Bonn, there was an ACE dialogue where countries from all over the world showed what they were doing in their own countries to uh, yeah, accelerate climate change by means of empowerment. For example, I know that the Dominican Republic organized a hackathon event in order to uh, empower young people to uh, work on climate change. Um, I know the Netherlands, for example, the fact that we have youth representatives is also a matter of um, yeah, accelerating climate change. So I'm mostly focusing on how can we use education, public participation, public awareness uh, in order to yeah, accelerate climate change. But yeah, it's maybe not really a concrete project, but it's more like uh, at the UN you draft like all these decisions and, and legal text. And I'm influencing that in order to make them more ambitious and also giving input in how this could be done. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. I can, uh, I can do the mic. Uh, wow. My voice is loud. Um, do you think that public awareness is the um, best, um, best way to, to solve the problem of, you know? <laughs> Okay, so the question is, is public awareness the best way to solve this problem of yeah. climate change, basically? Yeah. Well, that's a really good question, actually, because you could also solve it on different ways, like making um, disagreements about mitigation and, for example, the Kyoto Protocol, which yeah. is not necessarily public awareness. But I think the key factor that is actually underneath of this whole climate change is actually the way uh, which we behave and how our, how our consumer demand is. And by means of public awareness mm -hmm. you can for example people who don't know what what the effect is of their behavior on this whole climate change system and who are not connected to other people that is getting really different difficult to change this consumer demand and to to change the way in which we we buy things and which we do things so i think the public awareness is a key issue but probably it's not always recognized as a key issue but it's definitely it's not an an or orbit it's like and and so you have to do and make this international agreement and you have to make sure, yeah, you um, you get companies on, and you have to make sure that we have this public awareness. Yeah, but I think you can do that in in some uh, in some countries. But when you you go to somewhere where they they say um, if I can eat, if I can live, I think that's the main problem. And public awareness uh, doesn't uh, doesn't solve the problem, and I don't know how to solve it. Okay, so if I, if I got it right, the question was like, if you're in a place where the priorities are just making sure you have a meal, then public particip uh, awareness on the issue of climate change is not really going to help much. Well, actually, last week I was in a, in a, also at the UN and there was this talk about reforestation. So there was, you have this Red Plus program on reforestation in all parts of the world. And they were talking about that. So we, we want to, we, there was like a funding and everything to make sure we, we plant more trees in all kinds of places. And then at some point, like, there was this uh, guy from N Nigeria standing up, and he said, like, yeah, it's all really interesting to just think here and, and make these plans for reforestation in our country. But what's happening in my village is that um, you're, you're driving in with all these trees. You plant these trees. Th there go lots and lots of water to these trees while we don't even have, uh, yeah, food and, and enough water to drink and to wash our clothes. So what then happens is that the local people, they just end up cutting the trees and using them for firewood. Well, he said, if we had done public awareness in the beginning, so making sure these people know why we plant these trees, and also this public awareness should also be public participation so that the people can say like, well, you can give the water to the trees, but you should also give some water for washing our clothes, for example. So in that sense, the public awareness could also help to actually implement these things like reforestation. Because if you don't have this public awareness, then yeah, locally this is not going to work. Thank okay? <laughs> One... Uh, so the UN is also uh, a gathering of nat nations and more and more nations are also hugely influenced by huge corporations. So my question is, how is the UN helping and how is the UN also part of the problem and what can be done about that? Okay, um, let me see if I, if I got it right. So, um, 
how is the UN part of the solution and part of the problem? But may it was also something with corporations, with businesses, right? Can you maybe rephrase that one more time? Yes, I saw recently a movie about the IMF, uh, how it really destroys uh, nations and or uh, damages resources in all kinds of countries for corporate interests. The United Nations is aware of this, but corp uh, nations also protect their interests. So, and they together are the United Nations. So, and I also hear a lot of, uh, of the bureaucracy within the United Nations and the clashes of interests. So I wonder, how is the UN helping? You must have experienced this. This is what you talk about, but also how is the UN in the way of a solution and what can be done about that? Okay. Um, yeah. So first of all, maybe um, how it's helping is like what, you, yeah, you said it right. The UN is basically just a gathering of all these yeah. countries. So the UN can be seen as a room where all these countries come together to make decisions. It is not the UN itself has a budget equal to the yeah, fire department in New York. So they by themselves cannot really implement that much but it's really getting the countries together and talk. So also the thing that the UN can achieve is making sure that there are international agreements, like the Paris one, it can like, yeah, because if you want action on climate change, it, yeah, basically the idea is that everybody have to do it because if one free rides, then yeah, the other one wants a free ride and things like that. So I think it helps in the way that we have this Paris agreement and that gives a lot of momentum and gives a lot of things. But on the other hand, it's a really, really bu bureaucratic um, system as a whole. And especially if you have a, problem like climate change which demands really urgent action and, and fast action then it's also really not helping to the problem as it is yeah it's really bureaucratic it's influenced by a lot of lobbyists and, and, and kind of things who, who also turn the project into the wrong direction um, and then the other thing is also that a lot of people can say yeah well the UN has to solve it and they have to solve it well yeah if you do that then it's going to take ages and ages and ages so in that way the UN is also really not helping by being such a big factor and, and being so slow I don't know if I answered your question more or less. Yeah. yeah, okay, so then the follow-up is, of course, how can we better this or what should be different, according to me? Um, I think one of the things that is getting in a good direction is that the UN should uh, involve more stakeholders into the process, like NGOs, civil society, because that are the people who are actually doing things on the ground and who also are not really, uh, they can do things without the consent of, of parties. For example, a company can just pledge to do, um, yeah, to commit to uh, reducing CO2 or, uh, or a city can do that. So I think uh, the UN should really make an effort to get these civil society groups um, yeah, more into the process and making sure that they bring in this right energy to do things fast and to yeah, lead by example, more or less. So I think that's a, that's a trend where we had, like for example, 20 years ago, the UN was really only parties and the, and the diplomats. Now we're also getting civil society in with like this really more activistic uh, view and who are actually doing things. So maybe that's one of the roads that, that's going to the right direction. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then uh, I think the time is over and then I'm going to introduce uh, the next speaker. It's Christian. He's a really good break dancer. Um <laughs> But that's not what he's going to talk about. I think you're going to talk about um, what's actually on the screen here. Save it forward, build a global battery to power the world. Well, good luck. <laughs> How are you doing? I think since we're going to talk about energy, energy is also human, right? So we, I think we just need to build a little bit of energy in the area. Can I just do some really quick demographic? So could you please just raise your hand if today is the first day that you are here at the campus party? All right. Can I ask you if it's the second day? Third day? Fourth day? Yes. Fifth day? Is there a fifth day? No, right. Yeah, cool. Tomorrow is the fifth day. All right. So, 
Can I ask you if you, can you raise your hand if you know more than five people in the audience? All right. We're going to make an extremely difficult exercise now. It consists of four things. First thing, you need to stand up. It's easy. You do like this. It's like something you learn when you're like a kid or something. You do like this. You stand up. And then what you have to do is really difficult. You have to shake hands with four people at least in the audience that you don't know and say two things. One thing is your name. And the second thing is the next, next country you would actually like to visit. I know it's difficult, but I'm sure we can actually do that. Let's give it a try right now. Let's, let's start. I'm going to start as well, as well. Yes. Cool. Yama. And you are not allowed to run away because the fun is all about to start. And also the people running on the background, they should join here because the most awesome things of the whole event is going to happen now. <laughs> all right, Otai, enough for socializing. <laughs> all right, guys, can we, can we slowly sit down again? Slowly, slowly sit down. We're gonna go for coffee and cookies. You have the whole afternoon to talk. We're gonna do that later. You know, like uh, like in kindergarten, that you don't talk until you're here, silence, and you just wait until like people just shut up and listen. We're gonna do that. Now let's let's try one more time. How you guys doing? This is better. It's better. Let's try it again. How you guys doing? Woo! Let's make let's disturb the other talk. Let's do it one more time. How you guys doing? Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, actually, I'm extremely excited now, even more than five minutes ago, to be here. Uh, we are here for a bunch of reasons. Everyone has different reasons, but let's call it the collective reasons. So the reason to be here at Campus Party and the reason to be here today at this venue, specifically. First of all, is because it's about being epic in a way. I got the feeling that walking around, actually, there's so many innovation and cool things going on that I got a feeling like, oh my God, we're kind of benchmarking humanity technology-wise. Of course, you don't count what happened in research life, all these kind of things, which is extremely just epic. It's about, it's about having fun, because actually we are also here a bit to discover more about the world and surprise yourself in a way. And how can you actually do that the most is by actually making new connection, making new friends, just believe in energy. And a really third thing that I found also extremely valuable is to be useful. Because actually, we hear all about this innovation, but sometimes we kind of forget that we have a lot of power in our own hands. And actually what we do and what be we behave, and we can actually influence quite a lot of stuff ourselves, as we heard actually before from the amazing Max, was it somewhere? Anyway, so from my side, who I am, apart from a crazy guy, what you need to know is that I'm uh, an energy engineer and I've been seven years diving in different topics of energy from organic electronics to solar panels to build environment to business to psychology to a little bit of everything, education and professional wise. And I'm also a break dancer for 10 years. And somehow I'm trying to actually combine these two worlds lately. What's relevant for today is that 
we are here on behalf of uh, We Do We, which is our uh, non-profit organization. And I don't use Prularia Majestatis, I mean say our because uh, the three co-founders are actually here. And what we do is we activate people to change the world. And you're supposed to do, ooh, let's try again. We activate people to change the world. Yes, exactly. What does that mean is that we encourage as many people as possible. Could you hear me before? I was talking 10 minutes for nothing. It's better, right? Cool. Yeah. We try to encourage as many people as possible to start an act of change. And an act of change is a project or an initiative with a measurable social impact. So you can think as far as making a social enterprise, but you can think as little as actually making a dinner with neighborhood you don't know to talk about the problem of your neighborhood. And we started this because there are a bunch of things that we feel that are uncomfortable about the world. And we started thinking a couple of years ago, like, can we actually influence these kind of things? And we actually started doing little projects with no money, with no resource, no network, and we actually came pretty far in the office of politicians, in the city of Rome, and other amazing things. But the bottom line is that it felt awesome just by doing things that we didn't think we were able to do. And in a way, we want to share our approach, which is the just do it approach, to basically allow as many people as possible to feel that you are actually useful on a daily basis. It's not much of a rational thing, but it comes really from feeling of being useful for people and for the planet. And you do this by having a positive social impact. So in a way, we are today here because there's something that we feel uncomfortable about. And uh, it's something that I personally lived on my skin being an energy engineer. And in a way, is we rely today so much on technology that also in terms of energy efficiency, energy savings, we also think about what the next uh, PV panel should look like, how the most L LED efficient PV should look like. But we forgot that we have a lot of power to just switch off the light, for example. So how many of you has thought that all these lights here in the stage Maybe they are useful, maybe are not. But and any one of you thought about it? Are they actually useful? No, right? Maybe they are, eh? but just about questioning if this, all that light is actually useful for some reason. So in a way, even working in the field of energy where everybody is working rationally to make the, the world a better place energy-wise, then in terms of behavior, even myself, I do a lot of things that don't, I behave in a way that don't match the, actually the world I'm building, trying to build with my action. So even when people is aware of energy waste, we are actually not doing that. Problem number one, we are, can save a lot of energy by just being more aware and change our behavior. Problem number two, that you can think it maybe is bigger, maybe not, there are still a couple of billions of people, and sorry if I'm a bit vague with statistics, I don't have access to reliable energy and electricity all over the world. So that's why we came up with this concept of this global battery, because you know in renewable energy, let me do a little bit of demographic anymore. Uh, does anyone have some bit of background about energy here? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, cool. So, little explanation. Renewable energy, if we think simply I know it's much bigger than that, but if you think simply about wind energy and solar energy, you have this problem of intermittency. So you need to actually, you don't have energy all the time you want. So you have to actually store this energy in a battery to use it whenever you want it. So it's kind of a really hot topic in the renewable energy wo world to actually understand how to store energy. So in terms of concept, we thought, okay, there is so much a need of just saving energy by behaving in a certain way and there is so much need to access to energy for two million people in the whole world, why don't we link these things with this concept of this global battery, where in a way you link the people that have a lot of energy to save more energy and store this energy, where actually some other people that don't have access to energy can access it. Is this physically possible? I don't know, but braining-wise, concept-wise, is definitely a fascinating concept. So. 
this Save It Forward project, actually, it's, uh, it's a bigger project and constitutes of three main parts. The first part is about charging this global battery, and this is done through energy savings via behavioral change. So how can we make people just save more energy? So this is topic number one. Topic number three is like how can we empower even more uh, projects in uh, developing countries and people are running away. They thought they could do that without having me talking back to them, but they were wrong. So it's about actually how can we develop more efficiently projects in developing countries, although I don't know this, I don't like this term, in a more effective way, so extract energy from the battery. And then the so second topic, which is the battery itself, is like how can we link these two concepts together? So what are we going to work today is first, you guys, we challenge you to come up with acts of change. So there are projects or initiatives with a measurable social impact about making people here in the world, in the West, in Europe, whatever you want to call it, save energy via behavioral change. And by saving energy, we can think in terms of direct, so switching off the light, be smart with the heating, use less hot water, commute less with the cars or do carpooling, two more indirect effects. So shop local, be wise about the packages of the products that you're actually buying or buy less meat or because every product that we use was actually there was actually energy uh, used to produce that. So everything product-wise actually relate to energy. So that's the first thing. And you can think in terms of awareness first because you have to build awareness, but then it's in terms of education because once people is aware, it's not enough. You need to change their way of doing how that's up to you. And the second topic, and you can choose to combine it or not, is actually if I want to get in touch and make a project in a developing country. If I want to contact someone from the University of Baghdad or whatever projects in Kampala, Uganda, because I have this cool idea, how can I reach them to have an informal conversation and talk about the projects? Because the way it works today, there's so many motivated young people that want to make projects in developing countries. But the way it goes today is that you go to your professor, you go to that NGO, you go to, it's so long and bureaucratic if you don't have the, the right connections that sometimes you just lose the hype for doing the amazing things you want to do. And sometimes, I can give an example, now I'm messaging on WhatsApp with a guy from Kampala, Uganda, about making a project to teach uh, how to make uh, solar lamps to break dancers in Kampala so that they can go to the community in Uganda and teach both breakdance and uh, renewable energy things. And then the breakdancer can actually teach hip hop to the energy engineers. And I'm doing this through WhatsApp because it's just fast, it's informal. And I'm doing this because I have a local trusted network. So I have a friend of mine that is working there and I know that I can trust him and he gave the contact of this guy that he trusts so I can actually have a serious business talk with this guy on WhatsApp. So again, Two challenges today that you can combine. Develop acts of change on how to make people save energy in a direct way or in a more collateral way. And collateral ways, again, is just behaving sustainable and buy less uh, non-sustainable products. Challenge one. And challenge two, how can we develop more effective ways to get in contact we can think about students now in developing countries to talk about projects. And uh, we are going, I'm going to walk you a little bit through the program. First of all, how many of you is actually going to take part in the hackathon? All right, all right, all right. How many of you is actually going to take part in the hackathon? Because I thought there was something uh, wrong with the question before. All right, all right, all right. If you do this good, tonight at 8, we're going to have this uh, award ceremony. 
where you're going to win, if you're going to win 500 euros, plus another prize that's going to be announced soon. I, we have prepared for you a little bit of in, extra information. So the team, the people that are actually going to do that, we got access to a Facebook group when there is like a little resource pack where you get a little bit more information on such kind of things that you can actually do. We are going to have a pitch workshop, but not just like, yeah, you have to look people in the eyes, you have to start with why, awesome, interesting. But we are gonna have like a, a, a workshop from Tom is actually preparing his TEDx Eindhoven and I'm gonna help it a little bit as well. And it's more to actually get into the guts of people a little bit more and yeah, just communicate differently with our own approach. That is gonna be at six. Where is it? Make sure you're under the globe. Ah, and there's the Earth, right? Not Mars. So the hackathon is going to take per part uh, under the Earth. And uh, people that did not raise their hand, we can still have an informal chat because you are so much intimidated by this. No, I'm kidding. But we can actually go there and then have an informal chat. I can actually convince you to take part in the hackathon. And uh, well, we're going to energize it a lot. It's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. We can do some break dance if you want in the middle. That's, that's just like a few steps. And what else? Where is Max? Do we would like also to have a little introduction of the additional price? You will please come on stage. I never talk so much without moving. It's like weird because normally I was like, yeah. So for all the questions, hackathon specific, we can have a chat, of course, uh, later on. Is anyone who would like to participate, they don't have a team yet? Okay, great. Well, <laughs> okay, we're gonna find out. All right, and uh, so as soon as Max finish, please let's go all over there. Also the people that don't want to take part, because we're gonna make a group picture. Such a great marketeer, man. Anyway, okay, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah just really short. Um, so we have the, the really awesome price of just 500 euros at eight o'clock, but then um, I can also offer an additional chance to actually really implement the ID that you worked out. And that is because I work together with the Ministry of Environment and there's every year the Duozame Dinstar or the Sustainable Tuesday Prize. Um, they have now six categories, of which one is the uh, NG Youth Prize, which is about young people uh, thinking of uh, ideas that actually help to um, be more efficient with energy, but also to uh, connect people. So, um, yeah, I'm also in the judge of, uh, I'm also one of the judges from uh, Sustainable Tuesday. So I definitely would want to help, um, yeah, one group that is uh, coming up with a really good idea here to uh, guide them to also take part in this uh, competition. And for the other ones, actually, it's um, yeah, I think it's a really nice thing and it also has like a huge network of people from uh, from uh, CEOs to all kind of people uh, within um, the suitcase. So um, I think it's definitely uh, worth it to um, try to get um, this prize. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to ask, hello, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you can give a great applause to Christian who just held this presentation and then we'll see you under the globe. Thank you.